I'm so glad to be here. It's an honor, always an honor for me to be here. I love uh, Pastors Philip and Holly, some of our dearest friends and some amazing people. Come on, don't you love Pastor Philip and Holly and what they've done, <clears throat> what they've done in this church and leading this church? 34 years. Wow, how about that? 34, I'm only 34 years old, so I'm like, this is amazing. Um, unbelievable, 34 years, and to see their longevity and their commitment to you and to the church around the world and to this church and to the Word of God and to family, uh, I think we ought to give it up one more time for them and thank God for them. 34 years. Thank you, Philip and Holly, for leading well, and uh, what a cool thing God's doing at Oasis Church. Philip and I actually uh, served together on a board uh, called the ARC, Association of Related Churches. You may have heard Philip uh, talk about this, Philip and Holly, the uh, organization we helped start about 17 years ago to plant churches in the United States. Actually, statistically, the best tool of evangelism is to plant a new church and a new community uh, because you tend to reach a new pocket of people. Uh, and so uh, we have been a part of that. I've been a part of it from the very beginning. And uh, we have planted, uh, this last weekend, we kind of crossed over a milestone of over 800 churches that we've planted in 17 years, which is amazing. Isn't that cool? And someone did the math recently, and that equates to, this is, this is mind-blowing, that equates to about a, a half a million people, 500,000 people uh, are worshiping in these churches that we've started over the last 17 years. So this morning, we'll have a, a, almost 500,000 people in church worshiping in churches that we help start, you help start, because your pastors are a part of that, helping lead the way in that. And uh, so I think it's unbelievable. I think it's a great day for the church around the world, and uh, some amazing things are happening here in the United States and around the world where, where church is concerned, and uh, it's, uh, I just feel honored that I get to be a part, and very honored that I get to be here this morning. I love uh, being in this church, and I get to be here with my wife, who is here with me, and uh, we've been here for a couple of days on the West Coast. Baby, you want to stand up and wave, wave at everybody? Give a little wave at everybody. Been married 28 years, just celebrated 28 years of marriage in August, August 11th. How about that? August 11th, 1990, and we have two uh, beautiful children, a 20-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son. I think we have a picture. Maybe they'll put up with, uh, with uh, our, our kids and our dogs. And um, so we have, a, uh, we have a Labradoodle named Lucky, and then we have a Schnoodle named Pepper, <laughs> and then we, and, and our two kids, Mark and, uh, and Anna, and so <laughs> I guess I should have mentioned them first, right? <laughs> hey, you know where our priorities are anyway. Uh, our kids, Anna and Mark, and our dogs, uh, <laughs> thank God for family. I love our family. I'm thankful for everything that God is doing, and we uh, started our church, less than I did, 22 years ago, so this November will be 22 years. We started our church in Memphis, a lot of ups and downs, ins and outs, but uh, the Lord has been faithful. We've got four locations in the Memphis area. How many of you have been to Memphis? Let me see all the, all the great and amazing people who have been down to the dirty south, the dirty south. <clears throat> so we need to get more of you down to Memphis. It's a cool place, the birthplace of the blues. Come on, B.B. King and, uh, and Johnny Cash. And y'all know Aretha was born in Memphis, all right, uh, I'm just saying, and, uh, and FedEx. <laughs> FedEx. FedEx is headquartered in Memphis. Everywhere I travel, I encourage everybody, please send your packages via FedEx because as you do, you support the kingdom. You support the kingdom of God. <laughs> and if you work for UPS, we're, pr we're praying for you and believe in God for you as well. Uh, but uh, anyway, so glad to be here today. Would you grab your Bibles, everybody, turn over to the book of Luke the book of Luke, Luke chapter 5. Just want to teach a little bit uh, from God's Word and open up some thoughts to us and encourage us a little bit from this cool little story that Jesus told. Jesus, as you know, like, liked to teach in parables. The word parable, where we get our word parallel, what Jesus did was he took, he took real life stories 
and kind of the backdrop of the culture of that day. And he brought out truth that everybody could um, understand. And so we're going to read a couple of parables. We're going to focus on one in particular. It says, he also told them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old one. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. Here's the one I want you to see that we're going to teach on. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new fermenting wine will expand and burst the skins. And it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. Key verse right here. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. Everybody see it? And then Luke is the only one of the gospel writers that adds this verse right here. And no one after drinking old wine wishes for new, for he says the old is fine. So two big thoughts with this story, and I'm sure that you could surmise these thoughts as well, but I want to bring them out. Number one, God wants to do new things in your life. God wants to bring the new to you. The second big thought is the new will require change and change is hard. So Jesus obviously is teaching this. He's in a culture, Jerusalem, Israel, surrounded by vineyards and and, and, and it, was a, it was a wine uh, environment and culture. And so Jesus is bringing out this, this parable and this principle. And he's speaking to people who he knows will have to make a lot of changes in their life in order to embrace his, his coming and, and the new that God wants to do. And so he's speaking to them, Jesus is, but he's also speaking through them to you and me today that God wants to do something new in our lives personally. God wants to do something new in the church. But in order for us to walk in the new, we're going to have to be willing to change. Change. Everybody say change. Change. No one likes it, but it is a part of life. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything else is changing. Families are changing. Come on. This country's changing. The world is changing. Economies change. Churches change, companies change, 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 change. And we've got to be willing and and ready to embrace the new that God wants to do. So if you think about the story, there's three characters in this story. Uh, There is the new wine. Everybody say new wine. New wine in Scripture. We can read about it from Genesis all the way uh, to the end of the Bible. New wine represents blessing. It represents growth. It represents change. It represents progress and new opportunities and new seasons and new relationships and new assignments and new levels. Come on. Anybody get in the picture? That's what new wine represents. Blessing. Everybody say blessing. Blessing. And growth, listen, change, progress, all these new, new opportunities, new seasons, new relationships, come on somebody, new levels, all the new that God wants to do. In the Old Testament, the patriarchs would lay hands on people and speak a blessing, and part of the blessing was new wine, the growth of new wine. When Moses spoke to the people as they were getting ready to go in the promised land, he promised them that they would be blessed as they came into the new land, that they would be blessed with new growth and new wine. It's just a part of the blessing of God, new. We like new. How many of you like new? How many of you like new car? Ooh. You can go to the car wash now and get that new car smell. You don't even have to get a new car. You just get that new car smell. How many of you like new shoes? We love new shoes, new clothes. Anybody got new shoes on today? Come on, let me see. Anybody? All right, right? Proud. I mean, that, that hand went up fast, like. And uh, new. Come on, we love new. All right, now, the second character in the story are the wineskins. The wineskins represent you and me. The thing that has to hold the new. And there's a responsibility on our lives to stay in a place where we're fresh and where we can receive all that God wants to give to us. And the unseen character in the story is the Lord, who is the master winemaker, who also, who also makes the wine skins. And the, the wisdom of the master winemaker is he's not going to bring anything new into your life that will 
hurt you or crush you or devastate you. Otherwise, the new would be wasted and you'll be hurt, right? That's what we just read. But, but he wants you to stay fresh and stay in such a place that, that he can always bring the new into your life without overwhelming you or, or, or consuming you or destroying you. So, therefore, there's a mandate on our life. It's not an option. It's a mandate. It's, it, it's a responsibility that we have to stay in a place where we're fresh and we're able to transition and change and grow with the changes and we're able to stretch and adapt and receive all the new that God has for us. It's our responsibility. And so the, the, the master winemaker who was also the, the master wineskin maker would take the goat skins and, and, and sew the goat skins together and then flip them, flip them inside out and coat it with resin and flip it back. And as the resin dried, he then would take uh, all of the new wine, pour it into those wine skins. And those wine skins would be set in a place uh, where the, the, the new wine could ferment. And guess what? Those skins would expand stretch to their breaking point, but they wouldn't break because those, those goat skins were, were, were able to be flexible and stretch and expand. And, and then the new wine sat and it aged until it was ready to be, it was ready to be enjoyed. And so this idea of stretching is what I want to talk about a little bit this weekend. The idea of, of being willing to stretch. Everybody say stretch. And I think it's so important when it comes to change, when it comes to receiving all that God has for us, uh, this, this idea of being flexible. And so I want to talk about the power of being flexible, the idea of flexibility. And uh, if you look up the word flexible in the dictionary, it, it literally means this, the quality of stretching, the quality of stretching and bending easily without breaking. The key word is the word easily. The quality of stretching, the quality of bending uh, easily without breaking. That's flexibility. Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not get bent out of shape. How many of you know? You live in LA, you gotta be flexible. You got some kind of cycle festival today, and so you gotta take a different route to church, right? Whatever it's called, I don't know, who knows? Cirque du Soleil. Cirque du. All that, all right? Y'all keep shouting those names at me. I can't really hear them, but y'all know what it is, and you had to be flexible to get here, right? Come on, anybody. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? So, so to be flexible, the power of being flexible. Anybody realize if you're going to be a good mom, you got to be flexible. You're going to be a good dad, you got to be. How about this? You're going to be a good husband, you got to. Right? You're going to be used by God to receive all the new that God has. You're going to have to be flexible. Here's a question I want you to write down. Great filter question when you're in the middle of a situation that could be seen as a problem or could be seen as a challenge. Maybe you're in a challenging uh, a, a time right now. There's something going down in your family or on the job or what, 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 whatever the case is. Write down this question. Here, here, here it is. Is it a problem to be solved or is it a tension to be managed? Is it a problem to be solved or is it a tension to be managed? This thing that you're dealing with, this situation that you're dealing with, is it something you need to sit down and you need to solve it and you check it off the list and you move forward? More likely, it's a tension that you have to manage. It's not something you can solve. It's not a problem you can just fix. It's something that you're going to have to live with for a season. So you're going to have to be, come on, on your toes, flexible, ready to manage the tension. So much of life is managing tensions. And so I want to talk about these four tensions that all of us have to deal with. If we're going to step into the new, come on, anybody want the new? You still want the new blessing, growth, new season? Come on, anybody praying for new relationships and you're praying for a new job, you're praying for a new level, whatever it is. We sing about it, we pray about it. If we want to walk into it, I think there's some tensions that we have to learn how to manage. And I wrote down four of them. I think we'll be able to get to all four of them. Let's talk about them. Let's unpack them. A little play on words here. And hopefully you'll get the picture of these, of these tensions. Here's the first one. is comfortably uncomfortable. 
comfortably uncomfortable. Jesus makes this major point, major point, where the wineskin message is concerned. He says, no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new. For he says, the old is fine. So, I'm not a big wine connoisseur, but I know enough to know that everybody prefers the old. No one chooses the new, the new wine. New wine is always tart, it's bitter, it's agitating, hard to swallow, but the old is smooth. It's comfortable, it's easy to swallow. It's easy to swallow. The idea here, the lesson here, listen everybody, so important. The lesson here is there is a tendency to reject the new immediately. Without even looking into it, without even investigating, it's new and we don't want to have anything to do with it. We want to set aside the new because we love the old. We're used to it. It's comfortable. It's smooth. But the old, how many of you know the old wasn't smooth when it was new? Now we've gotten used to it and so we're comfortable with it. And it's so easy to just reject the new. I, I, I know many of you experienced what I experienced, you know, years ago when, when, when my bank said um, uh, uh, no paper, paperless, everything online. Cool. Let's get online. Now we got to deal with passwords, right? So who was your best friend in middle school? I don't remember who my best friend was in middle school. <laughs> Where, where did you live in the third grade? I mean, come on, give me something to work with. I don't remember all those things. How am I going to remember all these passwords? And so, so then, then we got used to online, and then it was an app. You got to get an app for your phone. Got to get an app, okay? Then I got used to the app, new version of the app, app 2.3, you know, whatever. It's always coming at us. The new is always coming at us. And, and, and we got to be careful that we're not just rejecting the new because we've just gotten so comfortable with the old. I read an article. I'm going to talk a little bit about church and weave some church into the message because there's great application for church. Church oftentimes has a hard time moving into the new uh, and has a, real, has a real love for the old. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it through, through, through the message. But uh, I read an article about Charles Stanley who, was, who pastors a great church in Atlanta. Some of you may have seen him on television, was the first pastor supposedly in the United States to bring an orchestra on stage. And there was an uproar, y'all. I say, y'all, I'm from the South. Y'all, y'all know what y'all is, right? Y'all, you all, you guys, use, use guys, depending on where you're from. There was an uproar because, wow, cellos and violins on the stage. Can you imagine the audacity and you think, wow, how in the world? Well, that was, you know, 50, 60 years ago. So we think now some of the new that's coming in and it's easier to reject than it is to accept because it's new, it's different. Here's the bottom line with, with this idea of being comfortably uncomfortable. How do you deal with being uncomfortable? How you deal with it is so important because most people, when they're uncomfortable, retreat to the comfortable. They run away from what's uncomfortable and they run to what is comfortable, but they never grow. They, they never push past the pain of being uncomfortable and get enlarged and have their capacity increase. We've got to learn how to, come on, let's say it all together, be comfortably uncomfortable, comfortably uncomfortable. How about this one? Conveniently inconvenient. Yes, the new is very often inconvenient. How many times have you been, un, you know, interrupted uh, and it was an interruption, but it turned out to be a blessing. It turned out to be something, something cool, something new. Wow, this is what I've been praying for. But in the beginning, you were a little irritated because it was not convenient. You think about the, the master winemaker and the wineskin maker. Think about what he has to do. Watch this. He has to prepare the fresh wineskins while the grapes are coming in, while the grapes are ripening on the vine. In other words, he doesn't wait till the grapes are ripened and the new wine is prepared before he prepares the wineskins. He has to prepare the vessel before the, the new wine is even ready. And so this is what God is doing in your life and my life. We look around and we wonder, why is God doing this? What's going on? I can't see how this makes sense. But the truth is, he's getting you ready for the new that you've 
you've been praying for and believing God for, and it's not comfortable, and it's not convenient. Have you figured out yet? If you follow Jesus long enough, you know he doesn't check with your schedule. He doesn't check. Is this convenient for you? No, he doesn't check, right? Sometimes it is conveniently inconvenient. How about this tension, exclusively inclusive? This tension has to do with people because more often than not, the new that we're praying for or the new that God brings into our life involves people. A new coworker, a new friend, a new teacher, a new manager, a new couple into the connect group. God brings the new through people. And we don't have, we don't have a right to be, uh, uh, to be exclusive. We've got to be exclusively inclusive. And so we've got to have a pretty large embrace as the people of God. The Bible uses the word whosoever. So I started thinking about some of the dynamics that we balance in church. And I thought I'd talk about three of them, just where, where church is concerned and the context of church, just to kind of frame this up so we can think about this in a little bigger picture. Because not only does it have to do with the church, but, but, but it has to do with us because we are the church, right, everybody? So think about some of the dynamics we, we manage uh, uh, in, in church when it comes to people. First dynamic is the dynamic of generations. Everybody say generations. So, so we have the, the older generation, we have the younger generation. And how many of you know, oftentimes in church there's a tension between the older generation and the younger generation. God himself in scripture identifies himself uh, as a God of three generations. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't identify himself as just the God of Jacob or just the God of Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, there's this, there's this flexibility, there's this stretching across generations. And think about as a church, as Oasis Church, as Life Church in Memphis, we don't have, we don't have the, the uh, pr privilege or prerogative, whatever you want to say. We can't say, this is, our, this is our focus group. You know, companies can get real good at getting, you know, real focused on this is our target audience. And, you know, a 55-year-old white man is our target audience, a company may say. As a church, we, we can't do that. We have to say that we are a, a church for everyone, right, everybody? So we're a church that stretches across generations. We're not just a church for young people. We're not just a church for older people. We've gotta be a church for all generations, and we want all generations worshiping together. Can I get an amen from everybody? That's what we desire. Now, if you're in the older generation, you may say, well, this for sure is a church for younger people because it's got moving lights and it's loud and, you know, blue jeans. <laughs> Whatever the case is, maybe you think, well, this really is a church for younger people. Well, this church, our church, we do have a responsibility to make sure that we're positioned to reach uh, this younger generation, because 96% of people in the United States, they become Christians under the age of 20. So we do have a responsibility. Now, we have a responsibility to have a place for the older generation, to value the older generation. And part of my responsibility as a pastor, I speak for myself in this moment, is to help the older generation um, realize that we're making room for younger people, and that's keeping the church relevant and keeping the church healthy and keeping the the church moving forward. And so the, re the, the, the responsibility on the older generation is to be more mature and, and to say there was a time when we sang my songs, now we get to sing their songs. Hello. Anybody out there? I, I've, I've had my season. I've had my day. It's been my generation that maybe was dominant in the church, and now there's a younger generation coming up, and instead of being negative about that younger generation, I'm going to be positive about that generation. I'm going to thank God that we've got 20-somethings in church, worshiping, serving, leading. Come on, is anybody hearing what I'm saying? So here's a, second, here's a second dynamic that we have to manage in church is, the, is this, uh, this dynamic of the, the different races, different skin colors, different ethnicities. 
So we don't have the, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it's a privilege, but it, just as a choice of words, we don't have the privilege or the prerogative to say that we're a black church or, or a white church or a Hispanic church. We gotta be one church that, that's able to reach all ethnicities, right? But, but sometimes that creates a tension. Sometimes, just like with the generations, it creates a tension. Why is the music so loud? Why do we have to sing all these new songs? And, and, and when it comes to, to racial diversity, sometimes that means for you or for me, we may have to set aside our stylistic preferences in order to celebrate all together as a church. We may not worship the way I worship growing up, but we get to worship all together, and this is a picture of what heaven's gonna look like. And so we're gonna manage, we're gonna manage that tension. We're gonna manage that. We're gonna manage that dynamic. Here's a third dynamic. What about this dynamic? And I'll, I'll, I'll frame this one up in the form of a question. Is church for Christians or for people to find Christ? Are Sunday mornings, uh, are, are, they, are, they, are they for Christians or are Sunday mornings for people to come in and, and find Christ? Well, it, yes is the answer. Yes is the answer. Yes, it's for Christians. Yes, it's for people to find Christ. And what that means is sometimes as believers, if I've been a believer or a Christian 20 years, 25, 30 years, I come to church, maybe there's certain preferences that I want to enjoy as a Christian, but I have to be willing to set aside certain preferences in order to create an environment where we're reaching people that don't know anything about what I'm singing about or what I'm learning about. We're not going to compromise the message. We're not going to water down or dilute the power or the strength of the message. We're going to manage the tension. So we can have room for people that are seeking and searching and wanting to find Christ. Here's a little statement that we make and we help our leadership at our church by using this statement. Sometimes you have to give up what you love for what you love more. Sometimes you have to give up what you love for what you love more. How many parents have made that decision? Come on, how many husbands have made that decision? How many business owners have made the decision? I really love this, but, but, but here's what I love more. When it comes to church and when it comes to the new, sometimes we have to be willing to be stretched and to be flexible. Man, I love this, but I love this more. I can't have both. I'm gonna be willing to be stretched and to be flexible. When it comes to church, people say, I wish we had one service and we were all together like it used to be. And, and I do too, but I love more the fact that we can reach more people and we can grow. You know, I, I love it when we had one location and we were all together, one family. I love that too, but I love more the fact that we can be in different locations and go into neighborhoods and reach people and be more effective in reaching people where they live. I love that, but I love this more exclusively inclusive. And then the last tension, this fourth one is so important. Um, it's this tension of being naturally supernatural. Jesus living on the inside of us. We are eternal people. We're kingdom people. When you become a Christian, the presence of God lives on the inside of you. So you're here on earth, 2018, living in this city and living in this cultural context, but you have eternity in your heart. There's a tension. There's a tension there. You don't want to be so supernatural that you're not having an impact naturally. You don't want to be so natural that you can't bring the presence of God into hurting and difficult situations. And so the best advice I could give you if you want to be naturally supernatural is listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit guiding your life. If you're a Christian, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is there. He's a guide. He's a comforter. He's a counselor. He will lead you into all truth. And that means the challenges you're facing today, right now, God has an answer for you if you'll listen. And if you'll listen and obey, if you'll hear and obey, it will keep you right in the right place, not stuck in the past and not out of touch with reality, right in the right place place. That voice that says, no, don't do that. Listen to that voice. That voice that says, yes, step into this. Listen to that voice. He's always speaking and you and I need to listen. And as we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, listen to me, everybody, is, 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 is called oil. It's the oil, the oil of the Spirit. The anointing oil is a reference in scripture. The oil 
keeps us from becoming stiff and dry. See those wineskins, those wineskins after being used could become stiff and dry. And if they were rubbed with oil again, they could be used again and they'd be refreshed. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit refreshes us. See, the, 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 the truth is we can become stiff. Wineskins can be stiff. This is the worst part of the message right here, everybody. Lowest part of the message. Because this is tough. This is tough. Scripture talks about uh, this phrase, stiff-necked. And as Christians, as believers, if we're not careful, we can get stiff. We can get stiff. Stiff-necked is a phrase that was used in the Bible. A farmer was plowing and Maybe there was a horse or an oxen or, 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 or a donkey, an animal that he was using to plow his field. And when it was time to turn, the animal refused to turn, became hard of neck or stiff-necked. Literally, the word means stubborn determination not to change directions. Stubborn determination not to change directions. And, and, and being stubborn, if I could just be totally honest with you, is nothing to be proud of. Many people just stand back and say, well, I'm just stubborn and that's the way I am. It's nothing to be proud of. Stiff-necked people, they're hard and inflexible. And often they're hard on people because they refuse to change. How many lives and how many families and how many churches and how many companies are falling apart today because of an unwillingness to change? an unwillingness to change. It's literally, I've watched it, I've walked with people, it's literally falling apart and you're digging your heels in because it's not the way you want it to be. So you're gonna watch it die and watch it fall apart. Let's make a commitment, everybody. Let's make a commitment to have the attitude that I'm not gonna be the reason it falls apart. I'm gonna be willing to grow, I'm gonna be willing to change, I'm gonna be willing to be flexible. Flexible, flexible, manage the tensions in my life, not get too hard. I'm willing to be naturally supernatural. See, our identities, let me finish with this thought. Our identities, who we are, who, who we see ourselves as being, our identities, our mindsets, and our habits have been primarily formed by our family of origin, by the neighborhood we grew up in, our family, our school, the church we grew up in. But when I become a Christian, when I become a Christian, then I go through this process of changing. And the Holy Spirit on the inside of me is now reforming my identity. So this is who I used to be, but now the Holy Spirit living in me is reforming my identity, renewing my mind, and helping me establish new habits that honor God and break the old habits that don't. This is Christianity. This is the journey we're on as Christians, to reform my identity, to renew my mind, and reestablish habits that honor and please God. This is spiritual warfare. You've heard that phrase, spiritual warfare, or that term, spiritual warfare. You know, sometimes we think it's fasting and praying long and, you know, uh, worshiping. And, and it does include those things, but true spiritual warfare happens Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and it's the Holy Spirit reforming who you are and renewing your mind and helping reestablish habits. Let me, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. God brought you out of that neighborhood. Now he's trying to get the neighborhood out of you. And the way you handle conflict and the way you relate to people. Instead of being angry and instead of, are you hearing what I'm saying? Instead of being resistant, and God's trying to teach you how to handle conflict because conflict is normal. Conflict with your spouse, and instead of the way your dad handled it, instead of the way your mom handled it, now you're trying to find out how Jesus wants you to handle it. So he's reforming your identity and renewing your mind and helping you break habits. But watch this, watch this. None of it is comfortable. None of it is convenient, and it's all supernatural. And so we have to be willing to be stretched and to manage these tensions in our life so that we can grow and become everything he wants us to be. It's not easy, but it's good. And it's the new that God wants to do in our lives, in Jesus' name. Come on, can we thank God, everybody, for his word? Can we thank God for the process? 
the process. Father, I thank you for this great church. I thank you, Father God, for what you're doing and how this church is growing and, and stretching and, and reaching new people and families are being healed and lives are being restored. And we thank you for it, Father God. The new, the new blessing, change, promotion, progress, new seasons, new opportunities, new relationships. Lord, help us to stay fresh. Help us to stay fresh and flexible, willing to change and adapt because there's a mandate on us to carry the new. To carry the new.